Copper, absolutely you know, great long-term story on the demand side of things. It's not just the EVs themselves, it's the charging infrastructure, it's potentially power grids behind those. So hello and welcome to the assay. Today we have Ian Roper, General Manager at Shanghai Metals Market Singapore, here to talk about commodities and the energy transition. So Ian, thanks for being here today. Thanks, Amy. And so um, we've been seeing record commodity prices since the start of the year. What sort of... Um, you know, what has caused these spikes and are the prices supported by the underlying fundamentals? Um, I think my belief is that they certainly aren't supported by the underlying fundamentals at all. Uh, all of the things we're trained to look at as a fundamental analyst, uh, inventory, supply, demand. I think most supply demand balances for this year are quite negative. And the main reason for that, of course, is China is slowing down quite clearly. We've got a 2% fiscal drag in the budget, 1.1 trillion less special bond issuance, less infrastructure spending. China's been kind of pushing the slowdown since Q4 last year, and that is very clearly having an effect domestically. Um, but for the first time in my 20-year career, China is not the driver of the prices. Um, normally, if China's slowing, we'd expect very bearish price environment, but that's been more than offset for now by this great global restocking cycle, right? So ex-China you know, demand largely paused for six months or so last year, and everyone is frantically scrambling up to that from the retailers through the supply chain. Um, and so the reason for the high prices is not Chinese-driven demand, it's the ex-China demand pulling material out of China. So we're actually seeing surging Chinese exports for steel, for aluminium products across the board there. And that is giving the illusion of strong markets in China. But actually, if we take away that export demand, the markets would look substantially weaker. Um, and then on top of that uh, global restocking cycle, we've also got the global macro flows, right? You've seen so much kind of hot money, fast money moving around the markets, chasing the dollar depreciation story, global reflation story, inflation risks, et cetera. Um, so we've seen waves of money coming into the commodities. You look at things like the the LME net long positioning and stuff that's been surging to, to record highs for many of the metals driving the prices higher. Um, so those speculative flows kind of get stronger or weaker, but until they actually turn short, until the people actually become bearish commodities and, and look to short them, then that's not going to actually break the prices on the speculative side. So kind of we've seen profit taking, you've seen money coming out of the commodities space on the, on the fund side of things, but that's not enough to push prices lower. We need the mm. macro to turn so negative people actually go short. Then you could see potentially very sharp price corrections. And following on from your um, kind of saying that you're seeing China really not, um, not experiencing that strong growth that we've seen in the past. Um, there have been a few reports recently um, from people like Goldman Sachs, noting that China is no longer the center of commodities pricing. Um, kind of what's your, what's your take on that, that statement? And So that's, that's certainly been the case this year, but I think that the issue to, is to not get too carried away with that fact, right? This is purely temporary, right? It's purely that we've got this great global restocking cycle Mm -hmm. So temporarily, you know, consumers, metal consumers in Europe and US and Japan, other markets are very tight for metal, right? There's just no metal on the ground in some of those areas. But that is a logistics problem, right? That's largely linked into the container issues, right? Container rates sky high and metals are quite far down the, uh, the priority list. So a lot of the metals just don't move um, uh, very quickly at the moment. So that's the problem. You've got pockets of fundamental tightness in certain areas, which are giving the illusion of strong tightness, strong demand, et cetera. But I think a lot of that demand is, is exaggerated by a great restocking cycle making up for last year. Mm -hmm. And yes, there may be longer term structural drivers, more infrastructure spending in Western countries, the energy transition, et cetera. But you know, given China's scale in the markets, I don't think that's going to take away from China as the price driver for very long. It's purely while we're in this great global restocking cycle. And of course, my fear is that, that if that restocking cycle comes to an end and turns into a destock again next year, while China's still slowing down, then the prices could, could look very ugly indeed next year. 
Interesting. And so um, on to kind of the, the main topic, looking at energy transition. Um, this seems to be one of kind of the major topics in the commodities markets overall right now. Mm. Um, which, which metals do you see being the top beneficiaries of this? And how do you see these trends playing out over the next few years? Um, and I guess as a follow on, how does battery chemistry um, specifically, how is that going to play into, into the trends moving forward? Sure. Thanks. Any good question? Certainly the, the hot topic of the day. Um, mm -hmm. So copper, absolutely you know, great long term story on the demand side of things. It's not just the EVs themselves. It's the charging infrastructure. It's potentially power grids behind those and some of the, the countries which you know, perhaps don't have enough strong enough uh, power distribution to meet surging EV demand. And then the energy transition as well, building up the wind, the solar associated kind of smarter grids alongside those. I mean, the copper demand growth on a 10 plus year view, you know, absolutely, we've got, we've got great fundamentals to that. And then throw in the supply question marks. I can see why everyone isn't very enthusiastic about copper, but just for the next couple of years, I think probably the prices are overshot, right? That the, we do have supply alternatives, scrap supply, for example, this year, absolutely surging. Next year, we should get the mine supply recovery. So yes, copper has a great long-term story, but current prices, you know, I would say all the good news is priced in for now. Um, and yeah, maybe if the prices sell off next couple of years, then that would be uh, make it more attractive to step in on that long-term story. Um, in terms of other commodities, uh, other battery materials on the specific battery technologies, I mean, the big issue is, yes, this debate of what, which technology is going to be the winner. Right now, there's a nickel batteries have a lot of fans, right? Technologically superior, you get a longer range, you get more power. So nickel batteries should be the clear hands down winner is the view of many. That's certainly not my view. Um, as with everything in the auto market, we're gonna see segmentation, right? The auto market has always had everything from budget vehicles to luxury high-end vehicles, right? People get what they pay for at the end of the day. So for people where budget is more important than range and power, I think the cheaper vehicles are going to be using LFP technology, right? The Chinese have been working very hard on that. They're now getting consistently 400 plus K ranges, decent reliability. Yes, those batteries often still have issues with cold weather power draw, but at least in countries like China, where most people live and work in high rise buildings, basement car parks, don't need to park in the snow, et cetera. That should limit that as a, a major barrier. So I think there will be segmentation within the battery technology space where LFP batteries will will certainly dominate probably the cheaper vehicles, whereas the nickel high, and increasingly higher end nickel batteries will probably dominate the more uh, higher end vehicles where people want extra power, they want extra range, stronger reliability, um, and are willing to pay for it, then that's where they will find a home. So yeah, we kind of split there on the technology. So I'd say overall, my view is that perhaps the nickel demand versus the consensus, perhaps nickel demand not as good as mm -hmm. consensus is expecting. Whereas, you know, in lithium space, again, you know, lithium hydroxide going into the higher nickel batteries. Um, so perhaps that's not so good. Whereas lithium carbonate into the LFPs, a uh, much stronger growth outlook, I think. I saw a recent announcement that, uh, <clears throat> that Tesla is considering the LFP battery as well. Um, do you know anything about that? I think that's specifically for the cars in China, right? Because okay. the, the Chinese technology is leading so the Chinese you know, consumer more accepting of it. It's, it seems to be, you know, that's what their competitors are doing. So I guess that's why they're, they're trying it out in that market. Um, so it's, whereas the Western world auto companies seem a little bit more fixed on the nickel direction. Um, so, but I imagine where the Chinese lead is the LFP technology has proven to be cheaper and kind of just good enough. Then I imagine you may start to see more Western countries following adopting the LFP technology at the budget end as well. And um, sticking with China, where do you see it standing in terms of the race towards decarbonization? Um, and what sort of plans have you seen um, that they are moving towards the school? Um, how does it tie into the next five-year plan? Yeah, so I think the, the, the official targets, of course, very well known, the 2060, zero, 2030 peak carbon emissions, you know, that's, that's what they've outlined, that's what they seem very committed to. Um, but of course, a lot of debate, a lot of uh, anticipation, maybe they get there faster, right? Maybe the peak will be earlier than 2030. 
and especially in a lot of heavy industries. But I think equally, a lot of the commentary probably getting carried away, right? The China is you know, known for its medium, longer term planning, right? We do have these five year plans. The five year plan for coal allows coal to be 200 million tons higher than it was last year, 4.1 billion ton cap on coal versus 3.9 last year. So coal is not disappearing overnight at all. It's still growing on a five year view. Equally for steel, the steel industry policy for the five years is that peak carbon emissions in steel will be before 2025. So not last year, not this year, but before 2025. So I think to, to some degree, the media narrative, our narratives kind of maybe getting overexcited that China's going down that pathway at an extremely rapid pace and you know, trying to, to you know, kind of say the peak was already passed and pushing heavy industries to, to reduce sooner. In reality, I think it is much more of a medium long-term story. Absolutely, they're committed to it. Um, but we see things like the carbon market rollout. So this year for thermal power, they're introducing the carbon markets. Ultimately, that will spread to heavy industries, steel, aluminium, et cetera, before 2025. So yeah, they have a lot of plans, definitely moving in that direction. But I think perhaps some of the narrative around that story may be getting a little overexcited in the near term. And I, so I guess in kind of the long term, it's more of a, a wait and see how the next couple of um, regulations and the next sort of policies that they roll out, um, how they focus on on that decarbonization then. Yeah, so it's absolutely a journey they're, they're committed to. Um, and yeah, it depends to a large degree as well how the world pans out, right? Is there global coordination on that? Do you start mm -hmm. to see carbon as part of protectionism, like with the Europeans introducing kind of carbon border tariffs, et cetera? How does that adjust the global competitive landscape? Um, all of those things, or you know, it's a constantly moving feast that's going to you know, lead to, to differing policy decisions over time. But I think yeah, China's clearly committed to the journey. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, they, they could do things to accelerate, perhaps. And I think a lot of that probably depends where the world moves. Great. Okay, well, all very interesting. So um, thanks for your insights today, Ian. That was... Yeah. Um, thanks, Amy. Yeah, that was really great. So thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you soon in person. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah. Cheers.